So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Gisela Concepcion is president of PAASE and Professor Emeritus at the Marine Science Institute in UP Diliman. Her main research focuses on marine biodiversity and marine natural products drug discovery. Today, she'll talk about microbial symbionts of shipworms thriving in unique habitats, omics and drug discovery. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Dr. Giselle Concepcion. Hello, Mom Giselle. I think you are on mute. Uh, cannot hear you. But we can see your slides, but uh, we cannot hear you. We can see your video. Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can hear you well. OK, so you may proceed, Mom Giselle. Sorry. Um, I'd like this, my, um, um, are my slides on full screen now? Um, not yet. So if you could please, uh, click on the, yes, that one. That's right. All right. Okay. Great. That's fine. So, um, good morning, good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to greet, uh, Joey, a very happy, blessed 80th, uh, birthday. I'd like to thank, um, Diane. Glenn and the rest of his family for the gift of Joey to the scientific community, both in the Philippines and uh, in the world. And also, I'd like to congratulate him and his academic family, uh, his collaborators, the uh, international scientists he's worked with, and those in the Philippines, uh, mostly in the University of the Philippines system. So today, my talk is on um, something that is um, uh, very critically affected by the environment and climate. And it's nice that Lemuel talked about marine mammals because now I'm going to talk about the marine invertebrates, a particular type, and their microbial symbionts. And I think this is an important model for how one health, health, biodiversity, and environment, biotic and abiotic factors are all interconnected. So it's really one earth, one world. And um, I like to say that um, symbiosis is really a model for health and wellness, even for humans. So I'd like to highlight here my three RAs who are excellent scientists, they're young, Irene Diane Uy, Marvin Altamia, and Noel Lasorna. And two of them are in the United States. One is in Cebu at present. And um, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, the funding from the U.S. National Institutes of Health 
Fogart International, ICBG, uh, International Cooperative Biodiversity Group Program, and the U.S. National Science Foundation, and my collaborators from the University of Utah, from um, uh, Ocean Genome Legacy Center at Northeastern University, and from the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, and of course, my home institute, the Marine Science Institute of UP Diliman. Okay? And the scope of PMS ICBG is really um, to study our marine biodiversity, to discover drugs, biofuels, and to pursue the underlying research uh, for these uh, areas of interest. And um, I'd like to show photos of uh, my collaborators, first and foremost, uh, Baldomero Oliveira. Do you see the arrow? So it is uh, Toto Oliveira who uh, collaborated for the longest time with Lourdes Cruz, who at some point uh, got me together with uh, US scientists um, that he had started to work with, particularly Eric Schmitz here. Okay, and Eric Schmitz was connected with Margot Haygood, okay, uh, from Scripps. And Margot Haygood became our PI, and all of us became uh, co PIs together with Dan Distal of uh, now Northeastern University and Gary Rosenberg of uh, Drexel uh, Academy, of uh, Academy of Natural Sciences. And uh, this is our NIH program director, Flora Katz. And uh, here's our postdoc, Bailey Miller and another postdoc, Ruben Shipway. And um, this was at a meeting that we held at the University of Utah where we had closed door sessions and um, poster sessions by our researchers. So um, as Lemuel and uh, Luli uh, have said, Philippines is really a hot spot of biodiversity, not just marine, but also terrestrial. So for this uh, PNS ICBG program, we were able to uh, survey 116 collection sites, collect 820 mollusk specimens uh, it, belonging to 44 families of mollusks that we had screened for bioactivity, preparing extracts from them uh, of our bacteria. We had processed 3,500 samples and uh, today we have about 4,000 bacterial strains isolated from this program. And these were done with collection permits obtained from the Philippine government. And there's so many of them, but we complied with all of them. Okay. And um, so I'd like to uh, now breeze through uh, the research that we've done, which just uh, ended its second phase uh, in July this year. And uh, I just would like you to have a flavor of the kind of research that we do that might be of interest uh, to you. And myself, I like to listen to talks where I can only understand 70% of what's been said because then it stimulates a lot of interest in me. And I am able to look for um, interdisciplinary uh, uh, areas, areas of collaboration. So here are a few activities. There's field collection, and then we have specimen identification, uh, I, sorting and photography, di tissue dissection and processing, and then we do the microbiology, and we, we actually start to grow them out in the field. So we do have sterile or septic setups in the field. Now, let me go to the subject of this talk, which is microbes. Microbes, uh, all of you know, are important in our, uh, well, in our lives. And um, there's lots of studies now on microbiomes. And now we realize that small is big. I think that's really come to the forefront with the devastating impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, virus infections. But uh, even in the, um, in the more ancient world in the seas, we do have microbes that inhabit sponges. Okay. We have bioluminescent bacteria in squid. And then let's jump to the human microbiome. Okay. Here you have different microbiomes or microbiota in different parts of your body. And this uh, population changes 
okay, in terms of their um, groups of bacteria, depending on uh, the disease state. So in inflammatory bowel disease, in type 2 diabetes, in necrotizing enter enterocolitis, then you have a shift in your microbiome. So now let's jump to uh, the um, host of these microbes that we uh, study. It's one of two groups of mollusks. The other being the gastropods, the most famous would be uh, the conoidians, the venomous snails. But this time I will talk about shipworms, which are not worms, but are actually bivalves or mollusks. And um, we landed thrice on the world, uh, in world news uh, because of the discoveries, the biodiversity studies that we did on, on three shipworms. And the biggest, giant, awesome, bizarre looking uh, shipworm called Cufus polythalamia or Cufus polythalamius uh, was like awesome. It was bizarre. And there is actually a slide on YouTube, a video on YouTube on what it looks like. And before I show its photo, let me just say what shipworms are and what they do. They belong to the family Theridinidae. They are bivalves with unusual lifestyles. First, they have environmental and economic importance or impact. Environmental, very, very important. In the mangroves, they are mostly mangrove specialists, okay? But uh, what's important is that they are major drivers of the transfer of carbon, of energy from uh, terrestrial, uh, from land to the sea, back to the sea. So, and that's because most many of them are cellulitic, say are cellulitic. And for the same reason, uh, these uh, shipworms have had historical and economic impact. Historical, well, it's been documented that this Spanish armada lost to the British uh, uh, fleet in the 16th century, was it? Because the uh, Spanish ships were infested with holes from shipworms, breaking down their wood. So that turned the tide of history. Economic importance today, it's billions worth of destruction that the shipworms continue uh, to uh, impart on um, wharves, on piers, and ships. So there's reason for us to understand why shipworms are so important. They are also known as the termites of the sea. So all shipworms have abundant bacteria in their gill. So this is like their general's uh, morphology. And um, uh, then they have an almost sterile cecum, and that's the digestive tract. Now, I'm going to talk first about that giant shipworm, uh, Cufus, where the cecum is vestigial. Okay? It's very, very small or degenerate. Where would you find the shell? And that makes it a bi bi bivalve it would be here in the mouth. It's degenerate, okay? It's degenerate. Okay, so uh, now this is your giant shipworm, which we uh, found in uh, Sultan Kudarat. So um, a newscaster reported it uh, from uh, the, the community in the Marine Lake in Sultan Kudarat. And then, um, well, since then we've been uh, collecting uh, these different types of shipworms from tiny to huge, okay? And uh, some of these will be mentioned again later. So now um, I say that they are, um, you know, animals with unique lifestyles. We're gonna compare the sediment dweller, which is the Kufus found in the marine lake, which is sulfidic, rich in organics, versus the typical shipworm, which is a wood borer found in wood. So um, here's Banca cetacea, which is like the best studied one in the temperate uh, parts of the world. Here's uh, Lyrodus, which is similar, uh, well, in lifestyle to uh, Banca. And here is your outlier, this huge 
monstrous shipworm. And here you'll see that um, they have uh, gills that harbor the bacteria. And here you'll see there is a very, very, uh, well, no, li likely no cecum. So obviously uh, the morphology, the physiology of the two types of shipworms, the anatomy, different. And this is likely due to its environment and where they thrive and where they evolved, okay? And um, well, here, there's wood intake, and here's there's none. There's no particulate matter intake, okay? So there must be another source of energy for this monster. And that has been found in our studies to be hydrogen uh, sulfide. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna say, hey, shipworms and bacteria are symbiotic. They thrive. They um, uh, do well for each other. So uh, the uh, shipworm provides the home for the bacteria and the bacteria are presumed to uh, contribute to the nutrition as well as the defense of the uh, host through primary and secondary metabolites. In the case of a primary metabolism for energy, we already know that the, uh, the, the shipworms thrive on uh, wood that they break down for energy, but where do they find the cellulitic enzymes? They are found in the holobiont or the resident bacterium in their gills, okay? But what's uh, the new discoveries that we're making in this uh, study of the uh, PMS ICBG that these bacteria also produce secondary metabolites, okay, which are your precursors for small molecules and um, that would mediate uh, the health and wellness of the host and also would provide the models for drugs for humans and uh, the rest of um, you, know, uh, you know the animal kingdom or even the plant kingdom. So here we have proof of bacteria that are uh, found in this uh, kufus and Marvin uh, suspected that there might be sulfur involved because he saw uh, the carboxysomes and they, he saw what he suspected to be sulfur globules. That was his hypothesis. And so sure enough, after we did uh, the uh, fish studies, the genetic studies, so um, we were able to, um, this guy is marvelous, Marvin. He was able to uh, grow this bacterium in thiosulfate and, um, uh, and, and, and uh, carbony. And this is the first reported cultivation of this type of bacterium. And afterwards is able to get the, um, uh, the DNA of a, a primer, a primer, he designed a primer uh, that would show that uh, these bacteria, so this is your um, general bacterial primer and this is your specific bacterial uh, primer for that isolate, that they co-localized in the gill of the, uh, of the ship, of the kufus. Okay, this is like an older study. Oh, so this uh, lady was also a postdoc of ours in the early part. And uh, here you have the, uh, a single bacteria site in Bankia that's showing lots of resident bacteria as well. Okay, so, very different are the bacteria in uh, the uh, wood borer similar to the sediment dweller? Absolutely not, entirely different. This is a sulfur oxidizing bacterium. This is a cellulitic bacterium. So this is an example of symbiont replacement driving host speciation. And it demonstrates the tight association between the shipworm and its microbiome. So um, here, to summarize, Kufus does not partner with cellulitic symbiotes. Unlike its relatives, it relies on endosymbiotic bacteria that use hydrogen sulfide to fix carbon dioxide into a biomass that can be utilized by it. It is the first cultivatable sulfur oxidizing endosymbiote that has been reported in the literature. So while we uh, made a splash uh, with uh, the, you know, the, the discovery of this marine lake with lots of kufus uh, in Mindanao, 
we also did make a splash with this bacterium. So this is just showing you that he, there's really this one holo endo symbiote. It's um, like the major one. And then we were able to isolate several related ones of this coded 2141T. And then when we did uh, the, uh, the homology, we could see that two of them were really okay. I mean, they were like uh, very similar. And then we uh, related them. So these are from the metagenomes, okay? And this is from the isolated. The, the, the purple one is from the isolate. And these are from the uh, metagenomes sequencing. So there seems to be a resident uh, major holobiont in uh, the gills of Kufus. All right, so eventually we published on this um, um, bacterium and called it Thiosocious Garadinicola, okay? And it is um, sulfur oxidizing chemo thiolithoautotrophic endosymbiont. Okay, now I'm gonna shift gears and uh, tell you a bit more about, about how omics is related to drug discovery. So drug discovery is so important because we know that um, our pipeline is running dry for major conditions uh, that we have in humans and even in, in other, uh, say, animal populations. Cancer infections, pain, neurodegeneration, aging, and we've always relied on uh, libraries. Combinatorial chemistry libraries have not uh, uh, given or yielded the promise that it um, it had uh, 10 years ago. So we now go back to biodiversity libraries, but then now we're aided by omics uh, and in silico driven drug discovery. Now on the right side, this is again to show you uh, how we are, are modeling uh, health health uh, you know discovery drug discovery from biodiversity and even from the environment. So we have ecological, biological, and chemical leads. And uh, symbiosis, I believe, is an important, important model. Because when you have uh, the drugs or the compounds, secondary metabolites produced by a bacterium that lives in the host, you might think that perhaps, you know, this, this drug has already been field tested or uh, organism tested for extraneous for say others toxicities okay so aside from mollusks we have been studying sponges for the last uh, two decades in the marina natural products lab at the marine science Institute. this is traditional drug discovery and we do this by first uh, isolating uh, and uh, archiving the microorganisms and working with my microorganisms and um, growing them in the lab is really contributing to a uh, conserving our biodiversity because we don't recollect the organisms, the macroorganisms. We can grow the microorganisms in the lab and try to get their, uh, you know, their DNA sequences, their RNA sequences, and uh, isolate and characterize and uh, test the compounds for bioactivity. So examples of uh, compounds that we have isolated from the Kufus, from the giant Kufus, it's not from uh, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, thiotropic, not the sulfur oxidizing bacterium, it's from another bacterium, actually a Pseudomonas aerunosa, from which my RA, um, Noel Lacerna, now doing his PhD in Utah, uh, isolated the novel Nindapirose A to C, which have antimicrobial properties, significantly against gram negatives, which are difficult to find. Okay, so most compounds are active against gram positives. Okay, now here we have uh, the, um, the uh, very, very famous uh, resting bacterium in uh, the, uh, the, the wood dwellers. This is Teradinobacter ternary that is um, uh, very, very well studied. And it's produced two compounds shown here. One is Turnerbactin, which is a sodarophore or a, an iron chaperone. And here is the tartalones, which is very potent antibacterial and more recently discovered to be antiparasitic. So these are being explored. All of these are being explored, but most of them uh, were first discovered through traditional drug discovery. But work has been done on these uh, 
uh, Turner Bactins and Tart Loads through the omics approach. Okay? And the idea is to try to get to the enzyme clusters, to uh, the enzyme uh, biosynthetic gene clusters that biosynthesize these compounds. Okay, so questions answered by omics are this, and I'm going to uh, just go through this more quickly because I know I'm running out of time. And so uh, here you have these questions that could be asked uh, uh, and answered by omics. What's the biosynthetic potential of the ship microbiome? And what's the genes across host genera? And uh, would uh, the symbionts be a major source of secondary metabolites that support the life cycle of the shipworm host and be uh, drug uh, candidates? And uh, here's uh, really uh, the relevance of what we've been doing. So we recently published this big paper, finally it came out, Secondary Metabolism in the Gill Microbiota of Shipworms, as revealed by comparison of metagenomes and nearly complete symbiote genomes. And our samples here came from Brazil, from the United States, and from the Philippines. And we worked on 22 gill metagenomes from six different host shipworm genera, Cufus, Dias, Diasayatfer, Bactrinophorus, Bankia, Teredo, and Neo Teredo. Okay, so um, we have 23 isolated uh, bacteria okay, that uh, we, we got the genomes from. And these are our detailed methods. So there's lots of bioinformatics studies here, but the long and short of it is that ship gill metagenomes are characterized by a few dominant bacteria species that reflect the host's lifestyle. So from left to right, we have the, um, uh, the um, sulfur oxidizers, CUFUS, and you see that uh, this uh, new isolate is uh, uh, dominant, really dominant, and then you have other sulfur is uh, oxidizing isolates, 2719, which is uh, orange, and disayathopur is in between CUFUS and the rest uh, which would be your uh, cellulitic isolates found in wood dwellers, okay? So uh, I think this is a very, very important finding. And what's more important is that ship worm symbionts and gill metagenomes are rich in complex secondary metabolite pathways. And we uh, were able to um, identify 122 gene cluster families uh, that um, belong to a uh, 569 biosynthetic gene clusters, BGCs, in both cultivated symbiotes and metagenomes. So there is a counter checking. So this is very real. Okay, you find it in the genomes of the isolates as well as the metagenomes, which we got from, say, the gills. Okay, and a uh, very, very uh, large uh, potential for discovering new drugs because um, you can see here that. Um, you have GCFs with complex pathways to trans AT polyketides, often active against human disease targets. Okay, and um, uh, then uh, we have this GCF3, which has three distinct variants in the isolates and metagenomes, and its synthesis product is a target for isolation and characterization currently. And there are, um, you know ways for us to be able to uh, get information from these uh, GCFs to guide our isolation and characterization as, as we are doing with the Bhutu anamides, which were isolated from a cellulitic bacteria, the gill tissue of Bactrinophorus collected near Butuan in the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. Okay, so no longer is it just NMR spectroscopy, spectroscopy, uh, HPLC isolation purification, we are guided by omics. Okay, more metagenomes from these, uh, uh, <laughs> these, these gills uh, of the uh, shipworms having to do with uh, the potential for looking for cellulitic, agrolytic um, uh, gene clusters, enzymes that might be important say, for waste recycling. So here we have Ai-Uri, Iris Dayan uri working on glycosyl hydrolases, hydrolases from these metagenomes. Conclusions, ship microbiomes are rich sources of novel secondary metabolites, as well as other enzymes that are important for, uh, 
for bioenergy and for uh, waste recycling. Widespread gene cluster families that are potentially important to the shipboard board lifestyle are present and are currently priority targets for compound isolation and characterization. Many of the dominant symbiotes can be cultivated. It requires some skill that Marvin Altamia has. Okay, and now he's trying to look at how the enzymes from the gills are moving from the gills to the cecum, okay, where you find the wood that they would need to break down. It's amazing the work that Marvin Altamia is doing at this time. Okay. Study demonstrates the potential of the metagenomic mining for identifying and targeting novel biosynthetic pathways. There's more. There's more shipworms uh, that made it uh, to the headlines. This is a new shipworm genera, the first that we, we uh, reported in uh, 100 years. Tamilok is the Philippine name for shipworm. Mabinia is where we got the shipworm in Mabini, Batangas, named after our national hero, Apolinario Mabini, the most intellectual or the most uh, scientific and scholarly of our national uh, art, uh, national heroes, uh, maybe on par with Jose Rizal. Another one, I mean, this is to the uh, geologists and environmentalists, imagine a shipworm that feeds on rock. Okay, so this was found in Abaton River rock in, Bo in uh, Bohol. And so we called it Litoredo Abatania. And this is where we need to collaborate with our geologists and our environmentalists. And now we have this ongoing work on Litoredo Abatania and we're looking at its microbiome. So with this, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, those who have published uh, the literature before us and with us. And uh, then um, I hope that you uh, get interested in these magnificent, awesome, bizarre, monstrous creatures that we're, uh, you know, uh, enamored with. Thank you very much for your attention. And Joey, happy, blessed 80th birthday again. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much, Mom Giselle, for the very informative talk. So 